sit down with author, director, activist, and screenwriter Gorman Bashar to talk about his upcoming book, his upcoming movies, and politics. All that and so much more tonight on Blue Mondays for February 9th, 2009. Good evening and welcome to an all new Blue Mondays. I'm your host, Stephen Handwork, and tonight we are joined by, well, live via Poor Man Satellite, uh, by novelist, um, director, uh, producer, screenwriter, activist, and, well, a very good friend of mine, Gorman Bouchard. Gorman, welcome to Blue Thank Mondays. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I have too many titles to fit on a business <laughs> yes, card. Yes, exactly. It's I don't think that that can ridiculous. possibly fit on one yeah. business card. Yeah. So let's kick this off by talking about, let's see, you and I have been to get, uh, working together for more than a decade, right? It's It's been a long time. Okay, well, let's first talk about the first project that we worked on together, uh, the story uh, of the short film, really, uh, that actually came from your short story, The Pretty Girl. Tell me about how that actually came about and how you envisioned taking that to the Internet. The Pretty Girl started because I had had, uh, through my books and my screenplays, I had optioned so many things, and I wanted to just get back into filmmaking. And I had seen this wonderful French short called Le Jeté, uh, which is probably one of the great, shorts of all time and it was which and it's done all in stills and i sort of wanted to do an homage to it uh thus the pretty girl and um i didn't have uh, access to a video camera at that point so but i did have a digital still camera so i figured that let me um take you know take rapid fire stills uh, and then have them edited together. Again, I didn't have editing equipment, so this is where I went to you, and through your knowledge of Flash, which was pretty much in its infancy at that point, I mean, not many people were using Flash, um, y you know, we just constantly went back and forth and just edited this piece, and The Pretty Girl ended up being great for me be uh, because it ended up getting into a bunch of film festivals. It won a bunch of awards. Uh, I mean, hell, I even got a trip to France for a week uh, because in France they actually pay for filmmakers to come over um, versus... U U.S. festivals aren't usually as generous. And the interesting thing here is this is before YouTube. This is before a great many folks had broadband, which brings me to my next topic, the Hazmat Diaries. Again, here, it seems like you were ahead of the curve. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I wanted to... Uh, I, I guess I saw so much potential in the web. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I was... Uh, uh, the people didn't have the bandwidth to enjoy our potential, I think. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, at the time, because, I mean, God, when did we do Hazmat? It had to have been 96, 97, somewhere around there. It was... We started that really early. Um, yeah, it was definitely some time ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't even... I don't even think Al Gore had invented the internet yet. Um, and, <laughs> um, you know, and so, but, but it was this great, I mean, it, it was such a crazy book. It was this science fiction book took place in the future, um, and very violent and so forth. And what we did was you took the actual text and had, uh, voiceovers, music, images, video. We just, it was this really cool multimedia thing. And I still get people, we finally took it down because I, 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 it was just like costing money to keep up, honestly, more than anything. And but I still get people who ask for it, which I think is amazing. You know, they'd say they they went to go back or they were recommended to people and they found that it was gone and they were really disappointed to see that it was gone. Yes, that is for sure. Uh, that was quite the interesting story, quite the delivery system, yes. and took a great deal of vision since it took place in the future, so far in the future. Um, some of your other short films that I am such mm -hmm. a, a huge fan of. Um, take a hard look at animal cruelty, or at least some of your views as to how animals are treated. Uh, you and I are such big animal lovers. Those films I'm thinking about are um, In Her Eyes and This Used to Be My Beautiful Home. Right, right. Tell us about those. Uh, well, I was doing... Um, a, a very good friend of mine, uh, Kathy Nalani, started the video department at the Humane Society of the United States. And uh, my business partner at What Were We Thinking Films, my film company, uh, also works down there. And uh, it's Frank Loftus. And uh, they had talked to me about, do you want to do something different for their web channel? So I, I, I came up with this idea. It was right after The Pretty Girl. And I came up with this idea for an anti-hunting piece, which was in her eyes. Um, and shortly thereafter, they didn't ask me to do one for... Um, about the, the problems with older dogs in shelters. And that became This Used to Be My Beautiful Home, which um, is, is I, I really, I mean, they're both very sad. I actually, I actually probably 
like this used to be my beautiful home more because it you know it deals with a dog and an older and this old dog that thinks that's waiting in a shelter to be adopted and just sees all these puppies going getting homes and keeps thinking that you know he just wants to be like lying by a fireplace it's you know and it's it's the the, the plight of older dogs which is really really sad. yes absolutely and I think today if I watched it again and by the way I'm I, I'm I'm proud enough to admit this um, that I think I'd probably get choked up watching it again it's just an amazing piece and such an amazing way to to tell a story because you know you wrote this and shot this from the perspective of the dog hey, that's right that was from the dog's point of view it's just a beautiful heart-wrenching piece um so tell me with these pieces so far um we get into your well to get into your novels here in a bit uh, i'm wondering about your take it seems clear that the work that you do, obviously, you have something to say about life uh, that these were um, in these works, and that um, you must have some emotional buy-in to most of the projects that you work on. So we are wondering, and since this is uh, more of a political show, what are your thoughts on the recent election of President Obama, and has that changed your opinion of our country? Has it changed the opinion of our country? I mean. I feel that it's, I'm hopefully optimistic, I guess is, um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I hate saying it, but it's like, the, I think I, I, the, the one person I wouldn't want to be at this point is the president, because look at the crap he's inheriting. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you, we, we thought Clinton was inheriting, you know, crap from, from the first Bush. Uh, and and Reagan, I mean, I don't even think it's. I I think Obama's got it ten times worse. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, when you're thinking that, like, you know, the unemployment <laughs> the unemployment rate alone is just scary. People can't get jobs; they're losing their homes. Uh, now, of course, they could su supposedly, you know, now we can afford gas again because now the gas is down. You know, I mean, the whole gas thing to me was just my personal take on it. It was Bush's way of lining his oil friend's pockets. Uh, you know, uh, in his last year of office. You know, Absolutely. I mean, there was there was no reason for the gas to be four dollars. You know, but um, it, it it's I you know it's it I'm I'm optimistic. I mean, I I hope he delivers everything that you know that that he says he's going to deliver. You know, and it and a lot of it is near impossible. You know, though there is still a part of me that says he is still a politician. Yeah. So that's why I'm. You know, it's you, you still have to have the red flag up, and there's you know, unfortunately, right. he still has to deal with other politicians. And speaking of other politicians, since you are from Connecticut, I can't help but to ask you, what's up with your favorite senator, uh, the independent Democrat, uh, I, Joe I, Lieberman? I swear to you, I, I, Joe Lieberman, <laughs> Joe Lieberman is, it makes me embarrassed to be from this state. I swear to you. I remember once talking with uh, a guy who was from North Carolina, Eric Bachman of Crooked Fingers and Arches of Loaf, and he was really embarrassed because Jesse Helms was from his state. I don't think Lieberman's any any better than Jesse Helms. I think he's becoming the next Jesse Helms, which is a really frightening thing. I mean, I, I think John Stewart said it best when, you know, Lieberman basically spit in the face of every person who ever voted for him. I, 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 I cannot, I mean, I'm trying to like, like not say something really like something you can't use, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I just, I, I just feel Lieberman is, is the biggest hypocrite that we have in the Senate right now. I don't think there is a worse politician. I don't think there's a more dangerous politician. I think Lieberman has to go. You know, I completely agree. Well, I think when he first came up, both, uh, 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 you know, when he first came onto both yours and my radar screens is when he wanted to start to censor everything. That's, that was just From it. music yeah. to movies to books, yeah. he wanted to put labels on yes. yeah, everything. Yeah, him and Gore's wife. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that was when and it was just like, why are you trying to stomp all over the First Amendment? I mean, you know, it, and it's like, I mean, it, it, he just, I don't know, I it, sometimes it's weird. I, I notice it with old people because I used to have a, a, a beloved aunt and uncle who were the most liberal, liberal people in the world, and they reach a certain age, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, something switches, and they become Republican. I don't understand it. I, I, I hope it doesn't happen to us. But I, Lieberman, yeah. all of a sudden, just a flip, you know, something was switched. Uh, this, you know, was just, and bang, he just became this, like, ridiculous you know, re Republican. I, I hate saying it, but he really, really, I think, uses his religion. And, and he's, he's basically driven by his religion. 
and yeah. thus the whole war thing. Because, I mean, he's not supporting the war because he believes in the war. He's supporting the war because he's Jewish. I hate saying that, yeah. but I believe well, that. Well, you know, question. down here it's interesting. Um, you know, down in Louisiana, Catholicism is the predominant religion, and by far, and I've never really lived in an area where there was, you know, a de facto religion. Uh, when I lived up there in Connecticut, for example, uh, there was a huge diversity, especially on the campus of Yale. You know, down here they have a saying, um, or a label at least, called cafeteria Catholics, meaning that, you know, they pick and choose uh, exactly uh, the things that they'd like to adhere to and the things that are make life a little bit more uncomfortable or inconvenient, they conveniently push those to the side and pretend that, that they don't exist. And that surely seems to be the approach that Lieberman takes with his religion. I think a prime example of that is his ardent support for, you know, the gay and lesbian community. Yet on the flip side, side, as you just mentioned, you have his hardcore conservatism. Uh, the man just doesn't make any sense as far as I'm concerned. And I think that is one illustration as to why the man is viewed as such a hypocrite. Okay, so let's um, just hope that you guys can get him uh, uh, kicked out uh, the next go around uh, uh, in the elections. I honestly think after, after this debacle and his performance, you know, for... Uh uh, McCain, I, I I can't see him winning this state again. But then uh, again, yeah. I well, let's hope. Uh, let let's hope we have an announcement you know, of his retirement. But then again, it's like I couldn't see Bush winning a second term. So uh, what do I know? What do I know? Uh, yes, <laughs> you and me both. You know. So now let's move on to your novels because uh, one of the interesting things that I found um, from your novels. Um, is this, you know, especially being raised by a single mother, your first two mm -hmm. novels, The Second Greatest Story Ever Told, and then Balls, um, both of these novels have a strong, um, um, independent and powerful women in them. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell me, is this a coincidence? Uh, no, I just, I, I actually usually enjoy watching, uh, writing women more than I enjoy writing men. Um, and it's because if I write men, they're usually like ridiculously damaged and destroyed sort of like me you know <laughs> and um no but and, and and again i remember i grew up with a single mom as well so um and i've always I mean, a lot of my friends have always been women uh even when i've had girlfriends i've always kept them as friends after we've broken up it just always seemed to work that way it's like okay well we can't we're not we're not doing really good with the dating part but hey we got a lot in common let's still be friends um right you know and I, I don't know, I guess when when I wrote um, The Daughter of God, Alona Ann Cogswater, in The Second Greatest Story Ever Told, my first novel, um, I, she just was pretty much like, I, it was in a, a composite of, you know, my favorite parts of, like, all the girls I've known in my life. Same thing with Louise Gehrig, just a different, you know, just a, a, a stronger, you know, ballsier character, obviously, than The Daughter of God. Or in right. different ways. Okay, well, I see. Um, so in Balls, the, the, the meta story there is that you have a powerful female baseball player, and she has to fight all the way to the Supreme Court to win the right to play in the major leagues, right? Right, correct. And play baseball. Yes. So, wow, yes. you know, how, how did you come up with that? Uh, I mean, obviously, challenging gender roles is a very good thing, and a thing that I would say is, you know, quite co common throughout all of your work, and perhaps uh, professional mm -hmm. sports is one of the last bastions of, you know, male dominance. And again, we are talking, you know, you what wrote this, what, a decade ago? Well, more than that. It came, out, it came out in 95, so I probably wrote it in 93. Um, I... I I think that, I mean, you know, it's like everything always goes to the Supreme Court. And I honestly feel that if a woman uh, wanted to play baseball, it would end up having to be a Supreme Court ruling. Um, be, uh, it, it, people would just fight it all the way. I mean, it, people can't just sit down at a table and make a decision for themselves anymore. We have to have, you know, a court do it. Um, um, your next two books were Good Neighbors and Ninth Square, but I'm also missing one. Unwound, which was written under the pseudonym Jonathan Bain. So tell me about these novels. Uh, they went um, Good Neighbors, then Ninth Square, Correct. then Unwound, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Good Neighbors came out in 98. Probably, it's actually probably my favorite book because I really like the character of Juke Miller. It's, he's a, a, a man just waiting to die. He couldn't solve. He's an ex-cop, couldn't solve the one... Uh, crime that really, really meant something to him, which was the murder of his wife. And he's just, he, he quits the force, he buys a bar, and he's just basically sitting there drinking himself to death. And one day his neighbor is found 
Um, well, his neighbor, his neighbor is found by a cop with a bloodied 12-year-old boy at his feet, and the neighbor sitting in a chair with a gun in his hand. Cop tells him to drop the gun. The neighbor raises the gun, and the cop shoots him, you know, in police suicide. Uh, no matter what, Juke does not believe that his neighbor killed the kid, no matter how it looks. Uh, and that whole book started out of, again, love for dogs. Uh, because uh, the, the whole, as you get into the story, you start realizing the kid that's dead at the neighbor's feet is responsible for killing the neighbor's beloved Labrador. Um, you know, and what, what would, it, it came from that, what would we do or what would I do if someone hurt one of my dogs? And it sort of grew out of that. Um, but I really love the Juke Miller character because he's so tortured. Uh, there's, he's just beyond redemption. And at this point, I mean, he's definitely one of those characters that he, he lives by his own rules. It's like, if he doesn't, if someone doesn't answer him the way he wants, he gets the answer he wants. He doesn't give it. I mean, he just, he, you know, he, he basically makes his own rules because he just doesn't care anymore. Um, you know, and I, and I think that that's what makes him a great character. Um, and then came Ninth Square. I wanted to write a book about New Haven. Um, and, uh, again, a, a fast paced, there was, it, it, Night Square is a real like page turner. It's just a fast paced murder mystery based in the city. Um, again, I pick on religion, a religious group, the, uh, sort of based on the promise keepers. I call them minor, minor called the sons of gods come to New Haven are having a r rally at the Yale bowl. And basically our main cop thinks that the escort services in the strip bar is going to be doing a bang up business as, as it's funny as when there's a Republican convention in town. The strip, uh, literally, uh, escort services and st strip bars from other cities send extra girls to the town. This is <laughs> yeah, true. But you know what? That's exactly yeah, right. They have to send true. in reinforcements when the Republicans for the Republicans. Come to town, which I think is kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it sure is. <laughs> yes, not hypocritical in the least. Um, you know, and uh, so yeah, that, again, another murder mystery. That one's based in in, um, in New Haven, and then. Um, I wrote another book called uh, Unwound, which is a very, very dark look at a writer who's sort of going out of his mind. Um, autobiographical, eh, maybe. Uh, and, you know, and, and uh, that came out, yeah, I did that under the, the pseudonym of Jonathan Bain, which is actually, there's an interesting story behind why I wrote it under another name. Um, basically to fool the- You know, yeah, do tell, because I don't well, think you've ever told me about this. It's basically um, to fool the Barnes this. and Noble's computers. Barnes and Nobles bases their orders, as does Amazon and everything else, on the sales of your previous books. And most of my previous books had like first printings of you know five to twenty thousand. Well, for this book, they wanted to do a really large first printing, so uh, to to get you know to tr fool the computers into ordering a lot, they basically have to come up with a new author's name, and that's oh, that's wow. basically it. But the first printing of this was one hundred and forty-six thousand copies versus you know I think the first printing of the hardcover of Ninth Square was 5,000 copies. Okay, Gorman. So now let's talk about your current projects. Um, what were we thinking films, right? Yes. Uh, how did that come about? Um, <laughs> well, uh, it, after um, I did The Pretty Girl uh, and all the shorts, I got a job doing um, directing a script of mine called A Kiss in Los Angeles. And it was just, it was really a horrible experience. Uh, they completely recut the film. I'm, I'm just not happy with that movie. I don't even put that movie on my resume, despite having a decent cast and we had a decent budget. Uh, um, so I decided that I needed to make a movie, a feature, and just prove that I could either do it or get out of my system and say, screw it, I can't do it, I'm just going to go back to books. So I made You Are Alone. Uh, it basically, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to raise a lot of money, um, so I wrote a script about... Two people in a room talking. That's the easy way to do it. And, um, you know, and that's a that's a great way to find out if you have the chops to be a filmmaker. Um, you Are Alone did really well. I mean, we got into 21 film festivals, won a bunch of awards from Best Feature to Best of Fest to Best Screenplay to Best Actress. Um, uh, it did well. It did really, really well. Um, and after that, subsequently, I said, okay, I, I, uh, right after that, uh, Unwound came out. And then, so then I decided to do another, another, um, film. And that was now Friends with Benefits, uh, which is the poster right behind me over my shoulder here. And, uh, it, um, Friends with Benefits is, is, a com is completely different from You Are Alone. You Are Alone was a very, very, very dark drama. Um, Friends with Benefits is a light romantic comedy. Um, and uh, again, I wanted to, after... The Darkness of Unwound, the book, Ninth Square, Good Neighbors especially, and 
you are alone. I wanted to do something a little bit on the lighter side. Uh, Friends Benefit had a slightly bigger budget. We were able to raise more money because you are alone did really well. And uh, I'm just now finishing up or tweaking it. I'm waiting on some of the score. Uh, we just started submitting it to film festivals, and we're going to be doing the sound mix shortly on Friends with Benefits. So hopefully, very cool. And years. you know, I can't wait to see the final cut. Oh, I have to admit, I did get to see a rough cut, and I, I think it's just a great film, and I'm quite sure that most of my friends are just going to absolutely love this film. Um, you know, Gorman, I'm sorry, but you know we're almost out of time, but I really wanted to spend the last few minutes of our interview uh, talking about one of my favorite pieces of uh, work from you, uh, and that's The Second Greatest Story. Okay. Uh, this we recently went back uh, to print, uh, to paperback. It actually came out in paperback um, after a really long time of not being available. Uh, so right now now people can get it in in, in paperback. And Gorman, um, I have to tell you, uh, now that I have my own copy, I am just uh, flipping uh, through those pages. Uh, and all of the great things that I heard about the book are all coming true right before my eyes. Um, you know, I, I, I have absolutely loved the story and concept since the first time I heard about it, but it was out of print. So if you can, tell us about uh, Ilona Cogswater and uh, the second greatest story ever told. Second, it's funny, and, and I guess in second greatest story also goes that we started, I, what were we thinking films was started myself and Frank Loftus. I mentioned him before, my business partner, who also works at HSUS. Um, we started the company to eventually make second greatest into a film, but we can't make it for a couple hundred thousand. It's it's definitely a two and a half, three million dollar film at the lowest. Uh, thus, we've been making the smaller movies sort of it, to get to get the company going. Uh, the second greatest story ever told. Um, yeah, it. So many people had been wanting it to be uh, put back into uh, print for the longest time. I've seen, God, I've seen copies of the hardcover go f up to like two hundred and sixty seven dollars, some ridiculous amount. And I said, you know, let me wow. let me get this back out and. Um, uh, Amazon actually has this amazing publish on demand, uh, which, uh, which is part of, it's just like your video on demand company and because it's run by Amazon. It's ridiculously legit. I mean, I get royalty checks every month. Um, and, but I can control everything. I control the cover. I control in, instead of getting seven and a half percent off the retail price of the book, I actually get 30% off the retail price. And as you saw from the copy of the book, you have, they, they look great. They look like any trade paperback you'd pick up in a store. Um, you know, but I just felt it was time for it to be back in print, especially because the story right now is timely. Uh, I, I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's 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 God sends his teenage daughter to save the world, but she's not here to save the people. She's here to save the planet. And let's face it, the planet needs saving. Uh, I mean, it's a very green friendly book. Obviously, it's a very animal friendly book. Um, I mean, her her message is. Be kind. She throws away the other Ten Commandments and says, I'm just going to give you an 11th one. It's real easy to follow. You can't mess it up. Be kind. Uh, and I mean, I think that, you know, and that ultimately is the message of the book. Very cool. You know, very cool. Well, tell me this, as I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly curious, with, with this story, uh, this book, did you receive any religious conservative backlash when the first, from when this? When the book first came out, yeah, we had gotten even like a few death threats and, 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 and so forth. Uh, because, I mean, it's, I mean, let's face it, it's, it, it goes... It goes after the fundamentalist Christians. Ah, in a challenges. Way. In fact, it challenges dogma. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really just you know goes after them and 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 makes them seem like the fools that they really are. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely, it sure does. And folks should know this is before. Um, this is this is uh, is before when this first came out. This is before movies such as Dogma. I, I mean, no, I, but I agree with you. I mean, and that's just that is one of the things. Uh, one of the big arguments in books is you know these these fundamentalist Christians go on shows like. Oprah and so forth, and argue it's like that. What right does this girl have to criticize the Bible? Uh, and and Oprah or whomever, I don't think it's Oprah at the time. It was um, there was another. It, it's Oprah in the script because there's a script version where now now of course is updated to Oprah. But you know argues that it's like well she has every right because she's God. She can change the Bible. Um, you know, but yeah, it's it's that that living that you know. It, but again, it's I think you 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 hit it on the nail also before. It's like they believe in the Bible for some things that are convenient right. you know but i'm sure there are, there are a couple other things in there it's like yeah we'll just sort of like you know skip over that part you know like like you know i i i do think that like the bible does sort of talk about like loving thy neighbor and you know and and so forth and you know and there's just these people tend to be just full of hate and you know they're just they're bigots 
You know, and it's like, I don't see anything, you know, in the Bible about that, you know? I agree. And, you know, Gorman, um, I'm sorry to say this, but we are completely out of time. I would like to uh, thank you, Gorman, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to sit down with us. And I would like to challenge folks that if you are interested in uh, Gorman Bouchard's work, uh, a great deal of it can be found at his website at GormanBouchard.com. And if I do say myself, it's a rather snazzy website. I, I think the website, it's one of the best looking writer websites you'll ever <laughs> that see. That is true. Uh, that is very true. And again, uh, while you're there, you can see a great deal of his work right on his website. And while there, you can click on over to your favorite retailer and pick yourself up your very own copy of The Second Greatest Story Ever Told or one of his many other books or DVDs. <laughs>